Hello, this is The Rock Podcast with me, Denny Somak. Now, I'm a rock historian, producer, and best-selling author. On this episode, I bring you into a new conversation with some of rock's biggest personalities. My guests are a band that you might not know, but you definitely know the members as well as many of the records they have played on and the records they have made classics. The group is comprised of Danny Korchmar, guitar and vocals, Wadi Wachtel, guitar and vocals, Leland Sklar on bass, Russ Kunkel, drums, and they've added prominent touring guitarist Steve Postel. Some of the artists they have backed include James Taylor, Carol King, Jackson Brown, Linda Ronstadt, Crosby, Stills & Nash, Fleetwood Mac, Hall & Oates, Stevie Nicks, Warren Zevon, Don Henley. I don't have time to mention the rest, but they have a new documentary coming that will tell you even more. It's titled The Immediate Family. After debuting in theaters in December for a limited time, it will be available for streaming on numerous services. They also have a new album out, Skin in the Game. I have to tell you, this was not an easy interview. The guys were on a video call in the middle of a lot of activity. Leyland was at home in Pasadena and Wadi was in a hotel room in Phoenix where he's on tour with Stevie Nicks. Russ was just finishing up a radio show and joined a little after we started and the stories just kept coming. One of my favorites was from Wadi about Warren Zevon and the classic Werewolves of London, but there's much more because these guys have worked with everyone. All right, well, first of all, where did you all meet? Don't tell me. I met Leland at a session. Right. Uh, Keith, Keith Olson, the late great producer, is a dear friend of both of us, uh, booked us together on a Bobby Womack session. Right. And uh, so that was our first meeting. And needless to say, <laughs> we related to each other instantly. Yeah. And had a great time. We had a great night. And then uh, shortly after that, I met Russell Kunkel coming out of uh, Studio yes, I, yeah. I was going in. And we were both driving the same 57 Chevy. And uh, Russell just said, are you Wadi? I'm like, yeah, are you Russ? He goes, yeah, man. And people are, we stopped in the middle of Santa Monica Boulevard. Right. Horns are honking and everything. And Russell goes, I got to go, but we'll be seeing a lot of you. And uh, so shortly after that, I got a phone call from Lou Adler's office wanting me to come play a session. Right. And I get there and it's Leland, Russell, and it's Danny Korchmar. So finally, after reading these names on records for months, there I'm with these guys who have become my brothers now. And yep. we, our, our bond formed that day. I mean, the, as soon as we started playing together, it was like we'd been playing together forever. What yeah. was what session was that? It was a, an album for Tim Curry. Oh, okay. Uh, shortly after the Rocky Horror. Yeah, that was. And uh, Lou was producing a record on Tim, so that was the first one. And then yeah. shortly after that, Lou was producing her, the Carol King's follow-up to Tapestry, which was Thoroughbred, right. and the four of us did that, and then we toured it. That was the first time we really hit the road together, yeah. too. What was she like to work with? Carol's a treasure. She's amazing. She's amazing. First yeah. of all, she's written every song you know, right? Uh, every song you grew up loving. And she, I mean, these guys worked with her longer, much longer than I did, but I've never seen anybody that in control in her mind and in her approach. Right. Russ is on the phone. <laughs> She just knows exactly what she wants. Okay, it right. was on the bottom. Those are written out beautifully to follow the chord charts. Mm-hmm. And she is a band leader. That's what I loved about her. Aside from the fact that oh, okay. so we passed nice. each other in the hallway. Okay. And she looked at me and she goes, are we related? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, I don't know, I hope so. Russ but, is on the way. Russ is on the way. Great, oh. great. So That's it was great. a joy making that record. And then like I said, like I said, we went on the road with Carol to promote the record. Uh, the thing that's, the thing that's great about Carol is she's like this in command. She just knows what she wants. And on yeah. the other hand, she's the quintessential Jewish mother. Right. You know, so like when we were on the road and stuff, she would be like telling Yo-Yo Ma at Tanglewood what to play on cello. And then she'd turn around and go, did you get enough to eat? 
right. <laughs> no, I mean, it was she's she's just such a fabulous character. I mean, she's yeah. almost a cartoon human being on a certain level because there's so many aspects to her that are just amazing. But you think back to when this was a young teenage girl writing the hit songs of the day is like oh. really astounding. It's astounding. I was just saying. How are like, you? How in control. Like, I I'm good, Danny. I'm good. Thank you, Danny. Thanks. Uh, there's a little mix up there. I had to take a jog to the left. No problem. <laughs> we were just, you know, getting to know ourselves among ourselves. So this is called the Rock Podcast. We're the number one podcast for classic rock, and uh, I appreciate you uh, you coming along and being on this. this no problem. Be. Um, I started writing so as I was telling. I started putting down songs because. All of you played on something. I said, wait a minute, this guy played with that guy, but then one had all three of them, and it, it got the list <laughs> so long that I sort of had to narrow it down to what I was going to ask you. So uh, the first thing we, we were going to talk about is is the movie, and uh, I've already got their uh, their opinion. Uh, you want to talk about the movie? Whatever they said. <laughs> I agree with it. Okay. <laughs> Sounds good. So really, though, the, the, I... I and I again, forgive me, I can't remember if it's two of you or three of you, really got together uh, on the James Taylor record, correct? Mm hmm That would have been Danny, Danny, myself, Carol, and then Leland came in after the record was made and, and did, did the first suite, the, the tour for Sweet Baby James, yeah. Right. So what was that like, working with him? What did you think of him when he first came out? Just completely unique never heard anybody play guitar with the style that he played and the way that he, the way he accompanied his singing was really pretty special. And that uh, voice that I, I'd never heard anybody sing like that. And his songs were really yeah. different as well. Incredible yeah. Lyricist. And as you, as you know, obviously, I mean, he was signed to Apple and did a record for them mm -hmm. and then left. Nobody leaves the Beatles. <laughs> Well, I mean that if you interview Peter Asher, he'd probably have a different story right. about, about all of that. I think I think the label was on its way out during that period of time, and I think Peter saw kind of a, a ship uh, that might be on its way to sink, and right. and 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 just knew that James was too, a too too important of an artist to get lost there. So, so he brought him to Warner Brothers. Yeah. So what do you you have favorite tracks from that album? You know, uh, there's a song on that album. It's not even a song. It, 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 it has a title. It's called, Oh, Baby, Don't You Loose Your Lip on Me. And all it is, is like, it's, a, it's like a blues verse and a chorus. Right. But it, it, it's kind of all done out of time. But he, you really get a sense of James, his blues root style singing. I just listened to it the other day. I mean, there's great songs on there. There's Country Road, there's Fire and Rain, right. you know, there's Blossom. There's lots of great songs on there, but that right. one really caught me. You remember hearing that, Wadi? Yeah. You know, that song? I vaguely do. Now that you're mentioning it, it's been a long, long time since I've heard it. Well, see, the thing is, is that they didn't have enough songs for a whole album. That's why there's a song called Sweet for 20G. He had three pieces, of, yeah. like three pieces of songs, and he stuck them all together to make that song because when, when they turned in the record, they got another $20,000. <laughs> <Right. laughs> now, did all of you work with uh, Warren Zevon or, or just you, Wadi? Oh, no, no, no. You're looking at the rhythm section for Johnny Strikes Up the Band. Right. And, uh, several other songs, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. You, know, you, you yeah. Pro, didn't you co-write uh, Werewolves of London? Yeah. yeah. Okay. How did that come about? With the Were, writing? Yeah, were you were you really at Trader Vic's? <laughs> no, no, Trader Vic's was uh, the last thing that got written for it, actually. But I really was at Lee Ho Fuchs, uh, the opening line. Right. Uh, and uh, we got a call. Warren got a call from Phil Everly because Warren and I worked for the Everly Brothers together. Right. And uh, Philip called him and said, "I just saw a movie called Werewolf of London." And you and Wadi, you guys got to you got you got to write a song called Werewolves of London. Right. So uh, Warren went, oh really? Okay. And I just happened to have gotten back from London, like the day before that. Right. And I stopped by the third 
writer on that song is a man named Roy Marinell, Leroy Marinell. And Warren was at his place. And I stopped by Roy's house. And Warren goes, I can't believe you're here. This is perfect. I said, why? What? And he goes, Philip called me and said he wants us to write a song called Werewolves of London. I went, Werewolves of London. I said, all right, that's easy. Because our friend Roy, he had this guitar lick sitting around for years right. that we tried to put on a million songs and it never fit. And it's the main lick that you hear in Werewolves, this that, that repetitive piano piece, piano lick. And I just said to Roy, play that fucking lick. And he started playing the lick. And I looked at Warren and I just said, I saw a werewolf with a Chinese menu in his hand, walking down the streets of Soho and they're, you know, looking for the place. I spit out the whole first verse at Warren. And I said, you mean like this? He goes, yeah, 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 just like that. That's great, that's great. I said, that's great? Okay, good. And then I said, and it's about a wolf. So we let's go, ow. And then he goes, that's great, that's great. And he says, keep going. And I looked at the time and I had to go play a session for Linda and Ronstadt. I said, you finish it, I gotta go. <laughs> you guys finish it. So I split and uh, they finished writing it out, except Warren was never happy without the ending. It didn't have an ending yet. Right. It needed an ending. And he kept telling me that even all through the times when we recorded the song, the ending still didn't exist. And we finally got the take we wanted. And I was out again on the road with Linda. And I get a phone call from Warren saying, I got it. I said, what do you got? He goes, I've got the, the ending. And he goes, I was uh, drinking a pina colada at Trader Vic's. His hair was perfect. And I went, that's it? He goes, that's it. I said, fantastic. I'll be home in a week. We'll record it. And uh, we had the rest of the vocal done. We just added that to it and uh, had our finished product. Yeah, what, he, what, what was he like to work with? <laughs> oh, uh, <laughs> it's probably a yeah. book, right? Challenging, I'd say, was a good adjective for him. Yeah. But I mean, you're one of the most musically inventive people you'll ever meet, and lyrically, beyond belief, his brilliance in songwriting was unmatched. But uh, at that time, in particular, when we did "Excitable Boy," he was uh, very drunk uh, all the time. Right. And it made it difficult, but nonetheless, we had a ball doing it. And uh, even when we argued, we had fun. But and there were many arguments. But uh, Warren was a uh, yeah challenging, I would say, but brilliant, always brilliant. And yeah. How he could go, how he could write like the, the kind of the goofiest, the hula hula stuff, right. and all, and then turn around and write something that rips your heart out. Yeah, like accidentally, like a martyr. Uh, yeah, or, it's unbelievable. Or, or hula, hula. Yeah, incredible. You know, he was. Uh, so, what was the first thing that? where the three of you were on together. Uh, it might've been the Carol record, I don't know. The well, the first, no, the first thing was the Tim Curry thing. Yeah. yeah. Were Pretty you sure. all, all three on that? And yeah. Danny. Yeah. I'm not sure if we did dates before that together. I mean, individually, I so. you know, no. I, I'd be working with Lee, I'd be working with Russ. Yeah. I think that, I think Lou's Tim Curry record was the first time we, with the ensemble we've become. Right. What uh, What did you cut with Linda Ronstadt? All kinds of stuff. Us. Yeah. Well, yeah. Wadi, you did the, what, what? Well, I started with what? her on uh, the uh, the record that had "That'll Be the Day." Right. That was the first. That was the first uh, rock and roll thing I cut for her. And there was another ballad on that record. Uh, I can't remember. Is that Hasten Down the Wind? She did Warren's song, Hasten Down the Wind. I think that was the name of the album. Right. Um, yeah. And uh, so that was my entrance to Linda. And uh, that'll be the day. And then we did the Simple Dreams record, uh, Blue Bayou and everything like that. And then after that, then Russell joined me and we did uh, Living in the USA album. Yeah. So I was with her for, you know, like three or four solid years uh, in the studio and on the road. Right. So um, were all three of you inspired by the Beatles? Of course. Yeah, absolutely. Really I've never been, only met one person who said no. That who was, was Jeff, that? Jeff Beck. <laughs> Jeff, well, yeah. Yeah, Jeff, Jeff knew them. Why would he be inspired by them? Yeah, another bunch of English guys to him. Yeah. 
Yeah. Well, it was, a, it was a toss up between the Beatles and the Pretty Things. <laughs> yeah, right. Right. Yeah. You know, the Beatles were a, a profound uh, effect on, on so many levels. Just to, you know, to me, my, one of my favorite things was I was an usher at the Hollywood Bowl when the Beatles played there in 1966. Oh, so wow. I got to hear them. And then in 1990, it was the first time I ever met uh, Paul. And uh, it was like one of those moments where you're just kind of crapping your pants going, holy crap. And right. then the three of us got to play with Ringo a while back with Joe Walsh. And uh, it amazing. was amazing, you know, sitting there looking over and Ringo's next to me. I'm going, this is too weird. It's, and we had a ball, you know, but they, they definitely... Uh, especially, I mean, Paul's the melodic side of his his stuff, especially kind of mid Beatles on. You know, when I start thinking about the things he did then, were just uh, remarkable. Uh, he's still one of my favorite bass players. He's incredible, and you know, it's him. By the way, I just want to add this paperback writer. That's him playing that amazing pre ACDC great guitar lick. That's mm -hmm. what, that's nobody else. That's him playing that standard. Yeah nasty guitar there yeah. and the track is just Ringo and him and and somebody going like this oh and there's a little there's a little rhythm guitar a little rhythm vibrato guitar in it no bass but it's McCartney playing that astoundingly great rock and roll lick He's yeah a serious rock and roll lick, aside from this incredible gifted sensitive musician he's he's unbelievable he's a badass yeah, him a badass. <laughs> so, let me ask you why did why don't you think uh, why do you think the section, which was sort of the forerunner to this, didn't uh, take off? Yeah, I th I think that the, the music really wasn't that you know I think when we got signed by Warner Brothers, I think because of our pedigree, I think they were sort of hoping for an Eagles, and when we turned in like a rock fusion. Right. instrumental album i think they kind of just sat there and went without me we've we've ended up with an incredibly great cult following you know people write to me all the time and still talk about the band and ask if we're ever going to make another record and all that and um but i i don't think they really knew what to do with us and it wasn't even though there was fusion in that period with you know return to forever you know chick korea and mahavishnu orchestra and different things of that of that ilk and weather report it's that's a small niche in the business and uh, and especially us coming from it from a rock standpoint as compared to a jazz standpoint they really didn't quite know what the hell to do with us um, but we had a ball i mean we it was really <clears throat> with the guys i mean i still talk to craig Durge all the time he lives 10 minutes from me and uh he's doing great and uh it was a it was a unique time then yeah. Well, they uh, they gave you they gave you three shots, right? You made three albums. Yeah, yeah, and I'm proud of all of them. I mean, everybody, I get people writing me all the time that still, you know, they cite different songs from those. That's when they're or they were in bands that were like fusion bands, and they were playing, you know, covers of the songs and stuff. Right. So it had its time, but uh, you know, we all moved on. Okay, so let me go back to the movie for a minute. Yeah, um, and you know. I saw a screener of it. You weren't here when I told it. Um, the connection with um, the Wrecking Crew was um, a director of this, and he was involved in that. Correct? Yeah, he did, he direct he did that was Danny's film. The Wrecking Crew was Danny Tedesco's film. Yeah, and, and his father was Tommy Tedesco, who was right. one of. The greatest guitar players uh, in in the in the world of studio that's ever been. Yeah. Well, I love these kind of movies where you get to see the behind the scenes kind of stuff, and um, it was it was great to watch it uh, and see all that stuff. And you had so many people making guest appearances. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's uh... we're blown away by the whole thing. So. Yeah. We're glad you. I'm really glad you like it. I'm sure I would speak for all of us and say we're totally thrilled that people are digging it. Is there Absolutely. Anybody, is there anybody who asked that you couldn't get to be in this? Either they were away or. I think everyone we asked is in it. Yeah. yeah. 
I yeah. mean, the difficult part is there were so many people, because I've talked to people since then that said, God, I would love to have yeah. an interview. But, you know, we're not the filmmakers and they have a certain time frame. You know, there's X amount of minutes that they can be recording. And, and in, in, in terms of like the stuff we've worked on, this, this could have dragged on to be a, a 15 hour movie easily. Um, if you wanted to address even more more things, but they had to look at it from a standpoint of making a cohesive thing. So, I think what they who they got was was perfect for this. Now, I I think you'll have to correct me if I'm wrong. Was it two or three of you that were on the James Taylor Carol King Troubadour tour? Were you? That was the, Danny Danny Leland and myself. Yeah. And what was that like? Amazing. Yeah. yeah. It was you know, Dan, Danny talks about that in the documentary and and it's a real real special moment where he says, you know, you you look out in the audience at that show and you see mothers and daughters holding each other and husbands and wives crying while they're listening to You've Got a Friend and it just made him feel like that this music that we were a part of making really meant something to people. You know. No. There's, there's there's also the old adage that you can't go home right. kind of a thing. well we got to go home and home was really cool you know, i mean the, the when we sat down to rehearse the the very first day getting ready for that uh gig at the troubadour right years and years and years had passed since the last time we all played together as that unit and it felt like it was yesterday I mean, immediately we fell right into the songs and it was a remarkable uh, experience, uh, b far beyond what I anticipated it was going to be. Yeah, absolutely. And which one of you or all three of you were in Spinal Tap? Russell. Oh. Yeah. Uh, Danny was in Danny's in it too. Though. Danny was in it. Danny was Ronnie Pudding. That's yeah. he, was in the, I mean, he was in the band called the Thamesman. Right. And I was I was in their incarnation called the Flower People. Right. Yeah. Were, you, were you one of the drummers that died? Yes. Yeah. My name was Stumpy Joe Childs. Okay. And uh, I died choking on someone else's vomit. Right. Okay. <laughs> Great movie. To this okay. day, good death. Good death. Uh, every band I, I uh, Danny, that me. didn't seem that didn't seem to affect you very much. <laughs> well, there I, you go. I got like a little laugh out of it. <laughs> yeah, really. Tough room. So many times. Tough room. It's just about every band, you know, they go, oh, yeah, it's about our band, you know. Yeah. No matter who you meet. Yeah. Yes. Uh, everybody. Right. They'll, they'll, they'll go, yeah. Not everybody's in it, though. <laughs> yeah, right. Now, you know, they're making a sequel, right? Yeah. Yeah, they're writing it now. Mm. Okay. Now, one of the other questions I usually ask people, because people always want to know, did, you know, I know you met Hendrix, right, Russ? Uh, I didn't meet him personally. No, I saw him play at the Whiskey A Go Go, but I didn't meet him. Okay. That's that that where there's some stuff floating around the internet that isn't true. That says that I was in the band as well and played on Big Pink. None of that's <laughs> true. <laughs> you mean nobody checks with you before they put this stuff up? You know where I think it came from? I think I did a, an, inter, an interview in Japan, and the Japanese, I love them so much, but sometimes they get their facts. You know, this, this stuff gets lost in translation. And I, <laughs> and I think they were asking me my influences, you know, the things that influenced me. And, of course, I said Jimi Hendrix and the band. And during that, I probably was talking about a time like 1969, 1970, when Are You Experienced came out and, and, and the music from Big Pink came out and right. how I was influenced by that stuff. And somehow they got from that that I played with them. <laughs> so I don't know. So, Wadi, I think you have an interesting story. You played uh, on Steve Perry's album? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Didn't, some, didn't you, they were going to put a saxophone, and you said, no, we're going to, and you went yeah, in. Yeah. And played. On, on O Sherry, yeah. I was yeah. going to play, play guitar on it. And to right. me, I figured that meant lay some rhythm down and play a solo. But I put the rhythm part down. And uh, Steve came in and heard it and said, that's great. Thank you. And walked out of the room and I looked at Nico Bolas, who is our dear, dear brother and producer and friend. Right. Great, great engineer, producer. 
Uh, I said, what does he mean, thank you? Okay. He goes, yeah, well, that's it. You're done. The rhythm part. I went, well, what are you talking about? What about that solo section? Right. And he goes, well, he's going to put us like a sax there. I went, sax? <laughs> no, he's not. No, he's not. I know what I know what should go there. Give me a track. He goes, well, I said, just give me a track, man. I'll show you what's going to go there. And I played the solo that you hear on the record is what I played. And uh, Steve came in and heard it. He goes, man, what is that? I said, that's the solo on your record. He goes, yes, it is. Yes, it is. And he and I worked on, uh, I had most of it done correctly. The ending of it wasn't quite right. So Steve and I filleted out the ending a little bit, the last couple of notes of it. But uh, that's how it went. Uh, they were going to do a sax. And I said, no, you're not. <laughs> Sometimes, you know, you when you're in the studio, you hear you hear what you think should be there or right. you know what should be there. And it was one of those moments where I knew this was going to work. I'm basically playing his melody. Right, yeah. Uh, with a, that sound that I like to call mine. And uh, it worked just beautifully. So, so I, how much input do you have when you work with somebody or do you stay in the background? Well, you know, our job is background. But right. it, it depends, like, like, for example, a moment like that, you yeah. know, where you say, I, listen, can I put a solo right here? Because I know what needs to go here. You know, and fortunately, the people that have hired us all these years trust us enough to go with us. And, and a lot of times they'll go, OK, wrong. You go, OK, fine. You know, you want to yeah. try it. But, you know, we're there to support whatever the song is. That's our gig. Okay. Uh I always look at it like when I get hired to do a project with somebody, it's like I'm joining a band each time. And right. I go in there and I, I may not be an equal member in this band, but I I, I never hesitate to make suggestions and, and throw ideas out. Um, and and but like I think I, I say in the uh, in the documentary, everything I do is etched in mud. Right. And that's the way I feel about it. You know, I'll, I'll throw ideas out. And if they say, no, nah, I kind of like what we already have, I go, fine. I just wanted to give you an alternative thought, you know, here, but let's let's just go with that. And uh, you you everything's predicated on the song, the song you're doing at that moment. There's no the, the rules from the previous song don't necessarily apply to that song. So you take each of them as an individual and you just try to create parts that really make the thing special and and unique to itself and it can be sometimes a bass lick that be that kind of defines the song it could be a guitar solo that people walk away going holy crap that's unbelievable right. it could be a drum beat you know that there's things like with russ where like most drummers i know in town like on a certain song might just sit be sitting there playing drums marking time and i'll sit there and I'll look at russ and on a project and he's doing things with brushes and textures he's he's far more orchestral than a lot of the other drummers I work with, where he thinks in a different way, man, it really makes, and it can make a record go from being mundane or you know, just kind of pedestrian to being, you know, unbelievable and a hit record. And that's kind of our gig is to really try to find those nuances and little nuggets to put in things to bring it to that next level. And it's a challenge every time you pick up your instrument. So I have a couple more questions and I usually ask everybody this, but I don't know how you guys would answer it because I was, you know, like, what are you doing next? And you each could be doing something different, correct? Because you don't know who you're going to play with. You get a call and you, you go. Well, that, that's always, that's always hanging in the balance, you know, for sure. You never know if that phone call is coming yeah, we're, I mean, we're looking forward to February for the record to come out and the gigs to happen. And right. That's what's next. Yeah, yeah, there's lots of little things going on, but that's our real focus right now is to really get this stuff all launched and and start to feel the response, see how people like the new record, see how people respond to the film. And, uh, and then in between every little moment there, do you find another project to work on? Okay. Now, I'm sure everybody asks you this, but... I don't know how you respond. Can you tell me each one of you what your favorite uh, sessions were on what songs that you're like really proud of? Unbelievable. It's so hard. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna get three different answers, which is why I'm oh, answering. Of course, of course. 
Uh, I, I, I'm proud of playing on Bob Dylan's new morning album. Oh, great. Love so that. getting a chance to work with Bob Dylan was special, but was it more special than playing on sweet baby James and, and tapestry and blue? I don't know. It, you know, that I've been so fortunate to work with so many great people on, on kind of seminal albums. Right. So. Yeah. Okay. Wadi. It's very difficult to answer that. You know, like, like Russ said, you know, it, it's one more important than the other. I mean, I love that we did Edge of 17 together. Yeah. Is, is that more important than my first night in the studio with Keith Richards on the first Winos album? It's, you know, moments that happen in the studio that are just un, unstoppable, uh, you know, that, that you can't, you can't believe these things are happening. And, and it's for us, I mean, it's, it happens so many times in the studio. It's very difficult when we cut up on the roof for James. It was right. like gorgeous moments. Yeah. You know, you know, Blue Bayou. I mean, there's just so many things you can't you can't nail them down. But it's yeah. too too many. So no. <laughs> Gotta get something from you. Um, yeah, there's been like everybody says, there's been so many. I mean, I look back to doing um Spectrum with Billy Cobham, became one of the seminal rock jazz fusion albums of that period or um no jacket required with phil collins which really right. launched it but then i look i look at all the stuff we did with james and you know and jackson brown's albums and and linda ronstadt and you know every one of them really it's like which ch child do you like the best they all have their moments in them and uh and i've worked on a lot of things i'm really proud of that never saw the light of day you know that just got buried immediately by the label or something like that but uh, i'm just always so pleased when somebody calls and says would you play on my record and i get to go do what i love to do it's, i still can't believe in a flavor of the month right business that i still get calls after you know 50 some years it blows my mind when you played on uh, spectrum with billy Cobham, was um I'm trying to think of his, it was tommy bolin he was there. Yeah. yeah, we. I knew Tommy. I, I was in a band called Wolfgang when I met James Taylor, mm -hmm. and, and Tommy Bolin was in a band called Zephyr. And we were both managed by the same criminal, so we did a lot of shows together and uh, stuff. And and when when the section opened for Mahavishnu Orchestra, and that's how I became friends with Billy. And Billy contacted me and he said, "Look, I got a going to do a solo record. Could you come to New York to Electric Lady Studios and we'll." Uh, do it and we cut that album in two days that's like basically one or two takes of everything that we did on that but I walked in and I had just been spending time with Billy and Jan Hammer but I look over and there's Tommy Bowl and I hadn't seen Tommy since our Zephyr Wolfgang days and he was still one of the most remarkable musicians I ever worked with and uh we had a ball. I mean, but it went by so fast. I mean, Robert Moog was hanging out and he had just developed some electronic drums. So Billy right. was using those on it and um, all kinds of Ken Scott was engineering it and who's a monstrously great engineer. So, but it went by so fast. Literally, we started on Monday morning and we were done Tuesday afternoon with it. It went by so fast. That I didn't, it was like a whirlwind on it. But I love talking about that. Go, go ahead. I love talking about that album because you know, I think it's a great album, but very few people really know about it. And it's one of the forerunners to real progressive rock. Yeah, yeah, and it was it was amazing. And it's, realizing it was 1973. Right. Pretty amazing. Yeah. OK, well, let me remind everybody that you have <laughs> a new album coming out. And now is it, the album is coming out in March. February. February. I guess 16th. The Actually, movie comes out in December. Yeah, December okay. 12th. Okay, I saw it. It's great. Everybody should go see it. Thank you. And uh, after this album, have you got plans for the next one? Or you can't think that far ahead because you don't know what you're <laughs> going to be doing. Um, yeah, we're, we're, we're going to wait and see what happens. We, so we, you know, we got the, the documentary coming out, a new album coming out. We're touring a little bit. You know, we're, you know, all the doors are open. Right. And the windows. Right. Yeah. <laughs> well, listen, I want to I want to thank you because I know you got limited time. You're each probably rushing off to a session, 
No, seriously though, thank you very much for uh, for joining me. Thank I you. wish you a lot of success with the movie. Like I said, I saw it. I think it's great. Um, I heard most of the new album, and great. you know, sounds good. You're doing a little bit of mix up. You mixed it up a little bit, and you got like what one cover song on it, right? Yeah. yeah. And I didn't, I didn't know people were fans of Sparks. I mean, I was like, what? Yeah. Waddy brought that into the equation. I really, yeah. I, I was going through all their material and I came across that song and it just, it just yelled immediate family to me. You know, and uh, it's just a great song for us to do. Believe it or not, there is a documentary out on them. Did you, were you aware of that? Of course. Yeah, yeah. yeah I figured. Okay. Fascinating. They're amazing. Oh, yeah. They're unbelievable. I find it hard to ask you guys questions that you don't. I mean, everybody's got an answer to every question. One <laughs> of you knows it. So that's what was what was exciting about doing this interview. And again, I appreciate your time. Wish you a lot of luck with both the album and the movie. Thanks, so Thanks Danny. Thank you so much. Thanks for doing it, guys. OK, you, you bet. All right. Take care. So that's just a little bit from the immediate family. Look for their new documentary. It's streaming on a lot of platforms and it's easy to find because it's called Immediate Family. And look for the new album, Skin in the Games, available wherever you get your music. Thanks for joining me on The Rock Podcast, the number one podcast for classic rock conversation. Please get in touch by writing to me at hello at therockpodcast.com. Watch this interview on YouTube and sign up to our channel. It's free no charge. In fact, there's no charge no matter what platform you get the podcast from. You can also find us on Facebook and visit our sponsor, AuthenticRockCollectibles.com for classic and other rock music and memorabilia. Until the next episode of The Rock Podcast, this is Denny Somak saying thanks for being there and goodbye till next time.